Okay, guys. <coughs> here I am with an, another new background here, although I probably need some pictures. So, uh, I've been going through the essential uh, tropes in these videos, sort of talking you through what the different ones accomplish in a poem. And it, to keep in mind, these tropes apply to like any of the writing that we'll look at. And also to remind you, I have a nice handout uh, from in week three that defines all these terms too. So if you like, you don't have to madly write down everything I'm saying because it's all there for you to refer to, but I just think it'd be helpful to talk them through. And so, so far we've looked at simile, metaphor, and metonymy. And today we're going to look at personification. Um, keep in mind that really all these tropes are kind of a form of metaphor. I mean, metaphor has its own function as device, but keep it, it, since they're all comparisons really uh, between literal and figural language to create new meanings, they're all sort of metaphorical. So, all right, personification, you might recall from high school, it's kind of a popular one they teach in high school. A definition of personification, guys, is when you give human attributes to inhuman things, okay? So anything that's inhuman that you project human descriptions or attributes or qualities onto, including animals. In fact, if you give human attributes to animals, that's known as anthropomorphization. But we'll just call it personification because anthropomorphization is a, a kind of a pain to spell. <laughs> so personification is just fine for our purposes. So if given an example of personification, Let's look at the first stanza of a poem that I'm, I had you guys read last week and that we'll be discussing in class probably or in a group discussion at some point. Um, it's Wordsworth's poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. And it's a kind of hippy-dippy nature poem, but a lot of students end up liking the poem. It's a, it's a good poem. I'll read the first stanza of the poem and you can just listen to the description of the daffodils in this stanza. Okay, so it goes, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over valleys and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So poem, this is a nature poem, obviously, and poems about nature almost always use personification because it's, it's a it's a classic way of bringing a human connection between the natural world and human experience to give human attributes um, to nature. So let's look at the stanza. Notice in the stanza how the daffodils are described. They're described as have being a crowd, as being a host, and they're being described as dancing. Now also recognize these are human attributes, right? Flowers don't form a crowd. You know, flowers don't have a host. And flowers, as far as we know, they don't dance. So fair enough. So we've got the human attributes down. But that doesn't really get us that far. We just know Wordsworth is giving human attributes to the daffodils. So remember the rule of thumb. You have to always sort of try to figure out what is the poet implying by this comparison, by making this personification. You know, what is he implying um, in this poem? In other words, what is the po why is the poet saying that this field of daffodils is like a crowd that is dancing? And notice what I did there, I turned the personification into a simile. That's kind of a nice little trick to help you see the different realms that are being compared. So if you have personification, you always have something that's not human being described with human qualities. Really, it's kind of like a comparison, metaphor. Something is like something. Okay, so the daffodils are like a crowd that has a host that's dancing. So if you look at that first stanza, Wordsworth claims that he's wandering lonely as a cloud. You know, of course, that's a simile. But what might Wordsworth be implying about his flying state when he stumbles upon a crowd of dancing daffodils? Well, Use your associative skills of interpretation. What do you associate, for instance, with a crowd 
that has a host and it's dancing. So a dancing crowd that has a host. Sounds like a party, doesn't it? I mean, that's what you have at a party. People dancing, a host of the party. It's a crowd, which, by the way, you guys aren't supposed to be forming crowds during the pandemic. Just got the video from uh, President Patillo. Watch that video. Anyhow, so it's a party. So therefore, in the context of the poem, you might ask yourself, what does it say about Wordsworth's lonely and aimless frame of mind right at the beginning of the poem that he stumbles upon a party? Of course, you know, good reading doesn't just, you know, end at that. Uh, you know, with Wordsworth isn't lonely anymore. He's found a party he can attend. Remember, this is not a crowd of people dancing in a field. And there's nothing in the poem at all to suggest that we're supposed to imagine that Wordsworth is really talking about a bunch of people and not flowers. His whole poem, right, is about experiences in nature, not his experiences with people. So doesn't this suggest that when the poet is lonely and feeling aimless, he doesn't find companionship and company with other people? Instead, he finds company with nature, right? So when the poem ends with him feeling the bliss of solitude, you know, as he claims at the end of the poem, he's sort of claiming I'm happy to be alone. Why? Because he has the better company of the beauty of nature and the memory of the daffodils, you know, and the party and the dancing flowers and all that. They said it's a hippy dippy poem. So there's an example of personification. So one other term, another trope, that uh, is similar to personification that I want to bring up, and that's pathetic fallacy. And I know it's an odd sounding phrase, uh, but it's another form of metaphor, a comparison. And it is somewhat similar to personification, but it's a trope that's used in a very specific and effective way, not just in poetry and literature, but in movies and television shows and in our own, our own experience in life, actually. In fact, you see pathetic fallacy all the time in movies and television. Pathetic fallacy is a trope in which nature and the environment and the, or the weather are being depicted as empathizing or sympathizing with the human experience. In other words, you know, if we're sad, it starts to rain, you know, of course, we know in real life, if we're sad, doesn't mean it's going to rain out. You know, nature isn't recognizing that you're sad and it's going to start raining. But in movies and literature, this happens all the time. So movies and television shows do provide perhaps the, perhaps the best examples of pathetic fallacy. For instance, notice whenever in a horror movie things start to get really scary or the drama picks up or it gets really creepy, there's always a thunderstorm, right? <laughs> There's always wind howling outside, you know, or if a movie, you know, wants to depict that the characters are sad or there's a death, I guarantee you it almost always rains. It's always rainy or dark or dreary out. However, if it's sunny and it's blue sky and the weather is mild and cheerful, it's more than likely that a movie or a poem is trying to convey a sense of happiness like in Wordsworth's poem, actually, where it's obviously sunny and joyful, and the poet claims in the end that he's got happiness. You know, so poetry does exactly the same thing. For instance, in King Lear's, uh, Shakespeare's King Lear, the moment that King Lear starts to go crazy, when he starts to go mad, a big thunderstorm breaks out. But pathetic fallacy isn't just the weather. Consider the atmosphere and the environment of a setting like a dismal, run-down, dark, dusty, foggy setting is unlikely to convey a sense of health and well-being. Shakespeare's Hamlet, you, many of you have read, you might remember begins with a scene in which the two guards are standing in the parapet of the castle in the darkness at midnight, and it's foggy, and both of them can barely see each other, and both of them are anxious and jumpy. Well, the atmosphere matches not only their sense of anxiety, but the sort of darkness and anxiety that permeates the whole movie, the whole play. It would be very different if Shakespeare opens it, you know, at noon in the sunshine and everything is kind of sunny and happy. No, 
it opens in the darkness at midnight where nobody can see each other. And it, not only that, it's foggy out. So here's the deal. Pathetic fallacy is very much a trope, a metaphor. The weather does not, you know, the weather does not, in reality, identify and empathize with us. It does not rain because we're sad. An atmosphere or environment does not change to conform to our moods. It's not dark and foggy out because we feel anxious. It's the way in which we project onto nature or the weather, you know, a kind of, you know, a mood or an atmosphere to create a kind of sense of tone or to give a certain implied meaning to what the poet or the author is trying to convey. Hence, pathetic fallacy is a way to convey human emotions through hu inhuman elements. We can learn, by the way, a lot about the mood and viewpoint of an entire literary work by recognizing how a poet or an author depicts the weather or the natural surroundings. It's a pretty nifty way to kind of get a grasp, actually, of what an author or a poet is trying to get at. You could easily write a paper about, you know, the tone or atmosphere of a poem or a story based upon the natural setting or the atmosphere or the weather or the environment that the story takes place in. Okay, guys, so the next uh, video lecture will be on my favorite, irony. So stay tuned for irony. Ta-da!